Have you ever seen a fight between a grizzly bear and a penguin? Because this is really what it feels like when you play the Jobava London. This opening is so effective that you can literally compare it to tennis. You can think of it as we're playing service and volley. If you don't know what that means, it is not my problem that you're living under a rock. But in a nutshell, one player has a very strong serve and then he literally runs to the net, ending the point in two shots. This strategy is incredibly annoying because no matter how good you are, there is literally no counterplay. So for this reason, I recommend you play the Jobava London because you get the insane advantage that one out of for games, your opponent is literally gonna be making this mistake and white is already winning on move three okay you know me i cannot just tell you the trap and then walk away so not only that i'm gonna be showing you how to punish that very common mistake but also genuinely explaining all the other continuations that you need to know all of these while walking you from my thinking process as an international master taking a fresh account from 600 all the way to 700 using the Jobava London. All right, everybody getting another white game and open up with D4. And uh, we're gonna be going over the Jobava London. Hopefully some uh, pretty principal lines, but so far we got uh, exactly what we wanted. The starting position for the Jobava, pawn on D4, uh, these pieces out and uh, okay, opponent develops the knight to C6, which uh, Pardon me, it is actually a pretty big mistake. And also, let me tell you that it is very common for this rating range. Now, it is your task to find out the winning move by uh, pausing the video. Because yes, you play the Jubava London. The difference with the normal London is that against the two knights uh, combined with d5, you just have a free win. So it starts with knight to b5, okay? And... You're gonna get all sorts of funny moves after knight b5. I've seen a6, I've seen rook b8, I've seen ignoring, but most challenging move is uh, e5, which I'm gonna be walking you through once we finish the game. Because there are a few details that uh, you need to know in order to like maximize uh, your win rate from this position. Now, when e6 gets played, we have a very simple plan. Uh, we just wanna continue with, you know, this is the reason why we played uh, knight to b5 in order to take on c7. It's like you're sitting on the uh, barber shop chair. You may very well just get a haircut, okay? Just uh, going ahead, collecting the rook. And uh, still, you have no idea how many times low rated players uh, fail to win these positions. It is simply because of the fact that uh, they don't know how to slow down, okay? The game starts at like a pretty fast uh, pace, winning the rook and you know, then they get very hyped. But no, you want the rook, okay, slow down. Time to relax, okay, bishop d6. We take, and I would say a really important life hack for these positions whenever you manage to capitalize on the rook. You just completely give up uh, on the a knight while like literally dumping it, okay, just leave the knight there don't worry about it and play moves like c3 e3 because these two moves will make sure there is no like knight before coming no more okay in other positions a lot of people make the mistake to play e3 and then c4 allowing a check so no the pawns are going like this c3 e3 and then you just want to get developed knight f3 bishop out castle a very simple plan so I'm just going to start uh, with pawns, okay? In theory, it is a little bit better to develop pieces, but I'm just trying to highlight the advantage of getting this very safe uh, pyramid. Nobody's going around. So now I'm going to continue with the simple task. You see that he just uh, took my knight. I don't care, all right? We already won a rook. We have a rook and a pawn for a knight. This is more than enough to win the game okay whenever you have even uh, only an extra pawn that is uh, more than enough uh, for a winning advantage okay when you have the extra pawn the situation is uh, dramatically simpler you just need to exchange all the pieces and you're gonna be winning okay there is one uh, small twist to that however because i get a lot of people uh, saying Oh, uh, I try to exchange all the pieces and then I lose. Well, the trick with exchanging all the pieces, you don't want to do it, uh, you know, like a monkey. You actually want to trade pieces that have 
similar activity. So you don't want to trade uh, your most active piece for uh, something that's very inactive from your opponent. Even though you're thinking, oh, I'm going for trades, you're sort of damaging your position. So first, uh, yeah, keep that idea in mind. Uh, trading pieces of similar activity or even better. Okay, see, he has a monster knight on e4, a very active knight. Now my knight is decent, but not so much active. So I'm going to trade my not so much uh, active knight for his best placed piece. Okay, I'm just going to do knight e2. Very simple move. Yes, the knight uh, moved backwards. How surprising. Going to recapture and he plays e5. All right, he plays e5. He opens up uh, the position with his, with his king in the middle. So he's basically uh, performing harakiri right now. Just going to take. And uh, we're going to have an easier time attacking his king. Now, we have very simple uh, fundamental rule. Rooks are going to the uh, semi-open file. So you could do either rook. I don't think it really changes anything. I think it's nice to generally have this rook kind of covering your king. But... Uh, I don't think this position was really um, going to matter. But okay, opponent just plays a normal move, defending. And here we have a simple plan that you can apply in these sort of blocked positions. You need to use uh, the pawns in order to, you know, unblock the position. So, just going e4, unclogging the bathtub. And then, he has pretty much no way to... Keep this thing closed. Also could continue with moves like um, F4, E5 if I want to expand in the center. But I just think taking the pawn on D5 is going to be more than enough. So he plays queen to E6. All right, queen to E6 is interesting because he is basically saying E5 bishop takes. He has enough pieces defending. All right, let's see. We take once. Now, is he going to take with a queen or with a bishop? Bishop it is. Now, once again, feel free to pause the video and uh, look for the winning continuation. All right. Here we have a very simple concept to apply. The bishop is pinned, so we got to do PP on the PP. And that means we put pressure on the pin pieces. Go C4, targeting the bishop. And then we're just ready to take it with the queen. Okay. We're just like literally going to trade every single piece until uh, we get him into a king and pawn endgame. All right, pretty simple. Let's see how that actually plays out. So, okay, he fell for the trap. He took, I'm able to just take with my bishop since uh, he is, you know, unable to take because I would be eating his king. Now, we attack his queen. I could have taken with the queen, by the way, but uh, yeah, I just <laughs> played an automatic move. This is also a target. We may go for check. Uh, okay, just gonna go queen trade. Simple stuff. He has to take. Uh, okay, against that, we go discovery and then he loses queen, so even nicer. And all right, the king alone is not gonna be able to deal with uh, the rooks and queen in an open position. Okay, spoiler alert white is winning in this position. And we also do by finding the checkmate. So. We get that. And you remember, I said it's very important that you watch out for e5, okay? Because in this position, a lot of people are like, first of all, the important question is, okay, how are we supposed to take? Do we take with a pawn or do we take with a bishop? Like, if you're looking with a computer, it's going to be like pretty confusing, okay? Like, both moves are like roughly equal. Okay, I'll give you a thing. Taking with a bishop is uh, objectively best according to the computer, but uh, in my opinion, what I think is the most effective move uh, based on how your opponents will uh, react, the e5 just works way better. Why? Well, simply because after knight e4, white has a very nice and juicy idea to pretty much just increase the advantage, okay? So feel free, pause the video, try to find it uh, on your own. And in case you're thinking, oh, has to be e6, yeah? Like opening a bishop's path, targeting c7. Well, the problem is black has a simple move like bishop c5. And you think, oh, I'm just gonna go ahead and fork him, I win. No, dummy, he just sacrifices the queen. 
you think you're smart taking boom you got checkmated okay you're not even getting the wooden spoon okay that's no good why would you even uh, do this then you come here and say oh Jabba London is bad I cannot win a single game with it no you have to just buckle up instead of e6 you have the stunning queen takes on d5 boom sacrificing the queen threatening the knight and the point is after the queen takes we win it back and once again important that in these positions uh you try to get rid of this knight sort of immediately okay if they play bishop to e6 do not castle because then you leave f2 undefended so you go rook d1 uh, you pretty much play a move like c3, not allowing any weirdness. You play e3, f3, try to get rid of this knight. You literally have three extra pawns, okay? Do that, and uh, I promise you're going to do very well from this position. Okay, now, there is one more move that's very important to remember, which is knight h5, okay? This happens quite a lot. And a lot of people, just because uh, they learn the variation that I just mentioned, they think... Oh, I got to do the queen d5 thing. If he takes, I'm taking. I'm winning back the queen. I even defend the bishop. How smart. But they forget black is not forced to take the queen this time. And they have knight f4. And black is already better. Up a piece. So, on knight h5, the important move to remember is we simply play e3, okay? Defending the bishop, opening up queen's path, and threatening to win a free knight, okay? And after like knight f4, pawn takes... Uh, let's say a6, targeting the knights, it is important that you go to d4, all right? Don't want to go to c3. It's not a disaster, but I saw a lot of people getting in trouble after a move like bishop to b4, pinning and threatening d4. So for this reason, knight to d4 just where it works uh, way simpler and better. Finish development, you got the extra pawn, and that does not have uh, much compensation for it. So, okay, that's pretty much all you need to know about uh, knight b5. The only critical move is uh, e5, and then you do what I just showed you. Other than that, he gives you the rook, you take, uh, make sure to set up this pyramid, get developed, get castled, completely dump the knight, and uh, you should have an easy time converting these positions. So with that being said, I think you can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. Going to be uh, starting the game with d4. And you already know uh, what it is. We're going to be going knight c3 and then getting the standard position for the Jabba London. Now, okay, it looks like opponent has uh, been uh, traumatized by knight b5 uh, in the past. So, therefore, he plays a6. Okay, this is not a bad strategy, okay? He is trying to learn. Like, big uh, shout out to my opponent. Um, okay, now... It is important that you kind of know uh, how to play this when knight b5 does not happen, okay? It's not like you play knight c3, bishop f4, you're praying for uh, knight to b5, he does something different, and now uh, your strategy just uh, collapses like a uh, castle of cards, okay, when you remove the bottom piece. No, you don't do that, okay? You have a plan. We start with a flexible move, okay? Important. Don't go knight f3. Typical, uh, you know, move order mistake. Because you always want in the Jobava to meet bishop f5 by playing pawn to f3. Question for you, how are you going to do that with a knight on f3? I guess you don't. So we play e3, keeping options. We want to meet bishop f5 with uh, pawn push. And, you know, it very much depends. Is he going to play with, uh, with a lock bishop? In the next couple of moves, uh, it's going to be pretty easy to tell what kind of strategy we're about to take. Um, with the bishop on to f5, we just uh, play f3, you know, it's like... The bishop is walking, uh, you know, outside in like a sunny day, and all of a sudden, you know, we play f3, goes g4, h4, it starts raining with pawns, okay? And the bishop, poor bishop, does not have the umbrella with him, okay? We just attack him. This is, by the way, one of the nicest things that uh, you can use from this video. I usually get uh, the best feedback from this variation. Usually people are the happiest while doing this thing. Um, I mean, almost to the extent that they don't need therapy anymore. So we attack the knight. Now, this was a bit of a mistake by my opponent because most people would be playing the move knight to d7, which in this specific scenario, because he does not have e6 on the board, Notice that the knight stops the queen from covering the d5 pawn, allowing knight takes on d5, winning a pawn. 
But you know, because I want to be a little bit more instructive and uh, give you a kind of in-depth guide and more like a better overview on how the strategy of this opening goes, we're going to act like uh, that's not there. And we just play important developing move, okay? We go bishop to d3. And uh, for simplicity's sake, whenever you play Jobavalon and you have uh, gone for this uh, attack on the king side with f3, g4, and so on, we're going to be taking back with a queen. And then we want a lone castle. Go knight e2. Okay, we're going to get to show that in the game. Very nice. Um, okay, I hope he will defend this pawn sooner or later. I mean, what else can he do really? We have simple moves. Castle knight e2. And by the way, whenever he plays h5 and we get the pawn to g5, you should always yeah, keep an eye on this g6 pawn push. Which I can even play right now, by the way. But I'm not. I'm just going to keep it very simple. Okay, we're going to get castled. Going to get 92. And then, if he still allows it, I may push the pawn to g6. You just, you know, like a very kind of annoying pawn push. It's like, uh, you know, he, this guy is uh, having a pretty nice house with like kind of an older fence. And we're just like trying to push him with a stick through the fence when playing this g6 move. It's just kind of, you know, very annoying for him to deal with. Uh can still do that. Queen e7, by the way, mistakes since uh, it's leaving the pawn on c7 undefended, which you should really pay attention and generally take. Now, should we take it? I wonder what's the most instructive way to beat this guy. Yeah, I think we take. It's just that if we don't take, it goes to like pretty weird territory because he's going to go long castle and it's a strange uh, piece formation. So I'm just going to take the free pawn and I'll try to show you the important strategy whenever you win a pawn okay if you guys don't know what's coming we're about to literally exchange every single one of my opponent's pieces and we'll try to conquer him in the king opponent game king opponent game that's for nerds no it's not that's how you win games stop dreaming of any kind of crazy attacks okay i know sometimes it may happen but Oops. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say that in the majority of your games, you're just going to be playing simple end games. It's not about fancy tactics or anything like that. But I realized the opponent may have a tactic of his own. Maybe this was a trap. I wanted to play queen to d2, but he has a very nasty thing in coming. But you know what? He is 600. If he finds it, good for him. Queen to d2. Okay, now he should be playing rook to c8. But it's not rook c that really bothers me, it's the move after. But I think we have a very nice kind of uh, little idea. Or maybe we don't. Yeah, maybe actually we just don't. Um, well, we have safe move, I guess. But yeah, it's like he is just like bothering me. Rook c8, we move the bishop. He has rook c3 ideas. Will he find it? Like I thought this was a blunder, but he just gets incredibly lucky apparently. I mean, honestly, it's like, you know how it goes. You think of a move for like two minutes, your opponent instantly plays something completely different. It will happen like that, okay? See, G6 is like genuinely ignoring it. But that is normal. And yeah, I wouldn't really be afraid of ghosts usually when taking such pawns on C7. I'm going to be showing you after the game uh, what I think would have been a better try for him. Now, immediately, we get rid of the annoying knight by playing... Uh, the move a3. The knight has to go uh, back home. It's gonna go to like c6. And okay, bishop took the pawn. Bishop did the mission. We no longer keep bishop there. I'm gonna go back. I could do all the way. I could also do f4 only. I'm gonna do f4, okay? Knight e2. Then play e4, perhaps. That sounds like a reasonable plan. But okay, opponent is also gonna get developed, get castle, rook to c8. He's only down one pawn. The very the game is like very much still open. Nothing clear yet. So yeah, b5, good move, just play. I mean, good move and not, because it's kind of neglecting development. B5 is part of the plan, but I think you should really prioritize development. It's really important that with every move that you play in the opening, you wanna get something developed. And I wouldn't really be so much afraid of this type of attack because there is a very important nuance of the position. Whenever you have this sort of uh, thingy in the Jobava London, it looks like black gets terrifying attack. 
But with your bishop on f4, you're very much safe because rook b8, you can always take it. Like rook b8 would be terrifying, trying queen b2. But no, you just uh, take the hanging rook. So I'm going to do king b1. Always play king b1. If there is a move that is always good in this structure, once you cast along and you don't know what to do, it's king b1. You play king b1, your opponent self-destroys himself. Okay, rook b8. Why is rook b8 a terrible move? Are you like even paying attention at all? Why is this not working? Of course, you remember, Jubava London, you got the bishop stopping that move. It's crazy like how many people just literally forget about that. Hey, rook b8, so tempting, threatening mate in one, but no, it wasn't working. And all right, now that we are ahead so much material, we could just start uh, chopping pieces off. But there's also e4 as a nice move, kind of getting into uh, more like trading uh, part. Also, he has knight b6, knight c4. Could be a bit annoying. So I'm going to start by maneuvering. Okay, knight is heading towards d3. From where it's targeting the queen, defending b2, just making the position safer overall. So we play knight d3, and then I think it's time to open up the position with e4. Still, you can notice that it's genuinely move 20, and the opponent did not develop bishop and did not castle. Uh, okay, still not making a threat, so just going to do e4 as promised. Uh, may have some ways to try and exploit this kind of hanging piece, like knight a4 maybe, but I'm just going to do e4. That's how you punish a king that's in the middle, so you should castle, or we may uh, open up the position and then attack him. Just saying. He should definitely get himself castled. I can also play uh, b3, by the way, if I feel like we need an extra layer of safety. Okay, bishop there. Uh, we take this kind of things, always trade. Okay, going to move the knight away. We're very happy to, the more we trade, you know, the easier the game will uh, become. Remember, the more trades, the more dates you get in winning positions uh, precisely. Don't trade uh, every time like a moron. You don't want to do that. Uh, preparing to play the move queen to c2, offering another queen trade. Happy to take back uh, with the king. Else we just maneuver the knight again. Also rook onto the open file is very logical, uh, fundamental uh, rule here. Um... Could also do d5, try to kind of wide open the position, exploit the king. I think I may uh, just stick with d5 just because it's a little bit more concrete and he's like really asking for it, keeping queens on the board. I think taking with the rook just because now it's getting a tempo, maybe a little bit more accurate, preparing to bring the other rook. So very important rule. The rooks will uh, double up on the open files generally. So I'm pretty much playing this move against no matter what he does. And it's kind of pity that he will get flagged. But his position was already kind of collapsing. So, yeah, very important. I think I may have made an accidental blunder by taking that mighty pawn on c7. Yeah, I'm literally worse. That was a poison pawn, okay? I just ignored his counterplay. It was a very random counterplay. But yeah, what, what I was about to show you was like rook c8. Okay, apparently computer still thinks we should be better. But there is no way somebody actually finds how to be better after rook c8. This is absolutely crazy. It, it is genuinely blowing my mind that white can still be better with the following move. And the main problem, just so you understand, was if you go back with a bishop somewhere, there is rook c3. Okay, rook c3, wow. Why is that even such a good move? Well, take it with the queen, get forked, you probably lose. Take it with a pawn, there is knight a2, you move the king somewhere, the queen joins. You're probably getting checkmated or losing the queen. So, okay, how do we defend against this counterplay? Well, it turns out white has a stunning move that I did not spot during the game. Believe it or not, queen h2 is perfectly safe. He has no way to target the bishop, very much ready to play a3, and white is just much better according to the computer, okay? That's very nice uh, kind of additional takeaway. Besides that, key rule to remember, you want to stay flexible with e3 so that you can meet uh, whenever you see bishop to f5 in the jubava. Okay, this is the rule. Don't think, okay, he plays uh, a6, bishop f5, that's when you do it. No. Literally every single time you see a bishop on f5, you play f3. It's just like, uh, you know, a dog that sees the leash. It, you, he knows it's time to go for a walk. He's ready. That's how you prepare. Same way. See the bishop, you play f3. Let's say c6 happens, stopping this. You do e3, bishop goes out f3. I mean, you get the point. So do that, push the pawns, whenever h5 happens, 
threatening this, you go g5, and then plan is to do bishop d3, uh, like, gate castle, knight e2, break with e4. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. And open up with d4, and uh, facing somebody rated uh, 700. And okay, d4, he plays d6. This has potential to become very interesting very quickly. We're going to be going knight to c3. And is he going to play the king's Indian? Okay, we have knight f6. So far, this is pretty much going according to the plan. You are going to go bishop to f4, just like a normal Jabava London kind of guy. So, getting these pieces out. Now, is he going to play g6? Like, g6 is going to make things so nice for us, all right? Okay, let's play e4. The important move to remember, okay? First move. And hopefully he's gonna do bishop to g7. That's like the most normal move. And we have a very important standard position on the board, okay? And here we have a pretty nice story that uh, I wanted to tell you. Now, pretty much whenever you face the king's Indian defense, it's uh, basically like, uh, let's say you have to return home uh, and it's night time. And like on your way, you find a pretty dangerous stray dog, you know, that's like kind of approaching you and it's, it's very scary. So, okay, at least what they teach us to do in Romania, I don't know how it's like where you are, but uh, they taught us to, okay, act like you're picking up a stone and just, you know, fake throwing it at the dog so that he gets scared and he walks away, okay? Don't try to run from the door, okay? I try that myself. I don't care how fast you think you are. Spoiler alert. You cannot outrun a dog. So, you know, you just act like you're fake throwing a stone and that somehow magically works. This is similar to the move that uh, I recommend here. So I see the King's Indian as a very dangerous dog that's trying to bite our ass. And we just play e5, throwing a stone into this knight. Like an imaginary stone, okay? <laughs> Let's see, is he gonna take? Now, if they bite, that is usually the, the best, I mean, the best move for us, the worst move for them. So we are like really hoping that they take, and they normally do like eight out of 10 times. However, he plays knight h5. Now this is either a great move uh, by my opponent or just a very silly blunder. Key move that you wanna remember in this position Bishop goes to d2. Why d2? Because he wants d5 after. So we don't want to take and allow queen trade in this fashion. So on knight h5, we go there. Pretty much just blocking this diagonal so that he's not getting the queen trade. Now, expecting him to go d e5, otherwise he's lost. Okay, why is he losing? Feel free to pause the video. Let's say he does a random move like a6. How is white winning the game? Uh, in case you're thinking bishop to e2, you're not even giving, getting the wooden spoon, okay? Nope. That's no good. Bishop e2 is like interesting, but not strong enough. No, you want to do g4, okay? Uh, attack the knight on the rim. Strapping it and winning it. g4 wins. So, therefore, he takes. We take back. And expecting him to take with the bishop. Now, key move to play queen e2. Target that piece and prepare in long castle. And... It is like really shocking that somebody rated 700 is playing the best computer line so far. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> this is really funny. All right. All right. Let's see. I'm curious how this game is going to go, but hey, who knows? Maybe he's just on a winning streak. All right. Going to go bishop to e3. Just because he was threatening some kind of annoying knight e4. But this guy, needless to say, very suspicious. Very much suspicious, okay? I even uh, spent two minutes telling you the dog story. Let's see if we can uh, resist against somebody that's kind of overperforming for this rating range, I would say. Maybe he's not. Like, so far, we're doing fine. Like, the variation that we are playing is not very principled. In a way that with best play, this is kind of what uh, black can get. 
And okay, e6, I don't think was a good move. I feel like h5 is just giving us a pretty nice attack. So yeah, the story goes, we're playing this variation. If they find this, we're pretty much uh, playing down a pawn, but we get very good attacking chances. So objectively speaking, I think the position is around equal. But if they don't play like my opponent did in the beginning and they go for what most people do, you can literally get checkmate in 10 moves. You have no idea how often that uh, happens. Like whenever I show uh, that line to some of my students, it's, it's crazy. It just becomes their best performing line. Okay, G5, clearly not a good move. I think taking is fine, but even nicer to start by uh, attacking his bishop. Um, so, okay, perhaps opponent was uh, not cheating at all. But yeah, from the very like first few moves, maybe he was just like cheating, you know, within the first moves to get a game and then he hangs everything. Uh, that could be the case, or maybe not. Who knows? But he won like six games in a row previously, so that's usually can be a sign. Okay, he goes for tactics. So bad the tactics are not working out for him. We're winning not one piece, but maybe two. Actually, he has bishop c6, strong move here if he finds it. I kind of relaxed a bit. Maybe I shouldn't. That's like the first mistake that you can be making. Is to relax in winning positions, but... So far, we're pretty much just uh, cashing in everything. Okay, he checks me. I just got a sidestep. Still, he needs to do that. He doesn't. And we're up a million pieces. And... Yeah, okay. At least you got to see how to play against one of the hardest counters of this variation. Because on the channel, we like showed in the past how to get this like quick checkmate. I'll even show it in the uh, in the analysis tab after the game. Like the most common line that's happening. But this is also pretty good stuff, okay? So I'm just going to get my bishop out. D4, D3, I think anything works. I'll just do D3 to play knight G5, target H7. So bishop is keeping an eye on that. Um, I mean, rook H5, G5 was also completely winning. Everything wins at this point. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to like do rook lift. Out of like, you know, courtesy, I played bishop to D3 to get my staff developed. But a lot of the times, this bishop does not need uh, to be... Develop to like win with this attack. So, uh, okay, he attacks uh, the rook. I keep the rook and uh, and defend it with 95, I think. That should be pretty good. Rook e8, still gonna continue with this plan, infiltrating. So, rooks are best placed on the seventh rank. Is he going to play rook e7? That's so nice. I genuinely want him to play rook e7. I want to show you guys such a nice tactic. I just hope he plays rook e7 because otherwise it's not working. I'm just trying to play waiting moves. All right, here. Feel free to go ahead. Pause the video. Try to find the waiting continuation. So if you're thinking there is rook d8, rook e8, and then rook g8, Okay, that is decent. Uh, this time, I'm actually going to give you the metal spoon. All right? I even cleaned it for you. But even better, all right, if you actually want to take your game to the next level, you can start with this right away. <laughs> and he's a, in a pretty funny mating net. Okay, rook d8, and he has only like rook e8 to block. We take it, and then, um, yeah, unstoppable mate. So... Important to remember this against the knight h5 line. This is technically their very best thing. And then you like push these pawns. Notice how uh, nice of a uh, attacking construction we got with this like queen lined up on the open file. And well, just to kind of show you a mating net, just because I like you guys, let's say black goes rook d8, we take. Uh, let's say we make a waiting move and just to do something very stupid. 
let's say black plays knight e5 and okay that is simple move like queen h7 pick up the bishop but the pattern that i'm trying to show you is you can force checkmate with queen h8 in this construction with these three pieces so if he takes there is nice uh finish with rook takes bishop covers everything now escaping squares and in case he would have uh, played what most of the people do after e5 which means takes i'm telling you they are genuinely gonna allow a checkmate every single time that you play this key move knight e5 point is knight e6 you eliminate a knight and then knight e4 knight e7 do not even take the rook but go for the checkmate so with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. I'm going to open up with d4, facing an opponent that's rated almost 600. We're going to be sticking with uh, our guns here, playing the Jabal Valona, and oh, bishop to f5, okay. I saw people recommending moves like f3. In fact, a rule that we have in the Jabal Valona, whenever we see bishop on f5, we play f3. It's just that we haven't really played Jabal Valona yet. Jubava London is completed once you get these pieces. And okay, we see bishop on f5. Fine. You can play f3 now. I'll give you that. Does bishop to b4? We don't really care about uh, that bishop so much. And just as a rule of thumb, uh, I'm going to be... Uh, yeah, I'll recommend you play a3 whenever you see such bishop on b4. Okay, just instantly clarify the situation. Now bishop a5, usually you can just clarify the situation with b4. Bishop goes back and typically you either hunt the bishop, like taking it, or you place your knight onto c5, supported by these pawns. It is very nice. I agree. We have gotten ourselves in like a pretty un unclear, I mean, maybe uncommon is the better word, uncommon situation. But I think it's pretty instructive how to deal with this uh, bishop pin. We're happy, you know, if he takes uh, on c3, we take back with a pawn and uh, we manage to get our hands on the bishop pair. And in this case, playing knight c5, it's like still his bishop is going to be so passive that he has to take and then you even get to improve your pawn structure one way or another. I think taking uh, with either pawn on c5 is very interesting. Usually it is taking with a deep one though. You get a strong square on d4 that maybe you can utilize. Um, and okay, your opponent kind of slowing down a little. I mean, if I was him, he probably should play knight f6 trying to castle. Developing knight on the natural square. Maybe he's looking for a way to somehow uh, um, yeah, take advantage of my knight on the edge of the board. He just plays knight e7, which is, I, I would say, a bit unnecessary because the knight could be more active on f6. So why would you place it on e7? Plays there. Now, because we have played the f3, we're going to be sticking with the other plan. g4, h4. Trying to, you know, go after the bishop. He has only one move. Has to go there. Then we're going to push. And... In that position, black has a choice, okay? Is he gonna do passive or aggressive? Here it's clearly better to do aggressive because it's kind of forcing us to play g5. And then the knight will all of a sudden become pretty well placed. So for this reason, I don't think our play was objectively best, but I do think is uh, what's gonna give you a good position uh, most of the times in uh, your game. So. Whenever, let's say, you see me play, or uh, maybe even uh, when you're studying my courses, you notice that I'm not uh, recommending the... Um... Okay, very strange move, by the way, because this knight is kind of sad now. Um, whenever you see me that I recommend a move that's not the best, according to the computer, it is because I feel like, uh, let's say, 9 out of 10 situations, the technically worst move will uh, apply really well in general. That is simply how I view chess and how I try to uh, really simplify things for other people to learn. I mean, it's proven to work so far. I don't know. You guys tell me. So just playing e3, then usually continue with bishop to d3. Still, it's like you can take every time. Could have done that earlier, but when there is no rush, why, you know, the bishop is not running anywhere. We have that 
annoying pressure. Just imagine the tension that the opponent has to go through. Always uh, considering, oh, is he going to take? Is he going to keep? Is he going to play knight c5? And we're just chilling. We, we know we can do that anytime. So, on bishop to f5, that is definitely taking as an option. And I think it's a pretty good option here. Sometimes it can be risky because maybe he gets access to a3, but doesn't seem to be the case here. I'm just going to play like knight e2. Develop, maybe he's going to take and we still get that structure with queen takes. He developed all of his pieces in a very strange fashion, like the knight on b8 precisely is uh, kind of uh, the saddest piece in my opponent's camp because he, you know, he, he had a choice. It's basically, you know, you have two kids and uh, you're telling uh, the knight on e7 that uh, you love him the most. No, it's like, dude, you gotta use both knights. Imagine the other kid when he sees, instead of, you know, being his turn to develop, you play the other one in his place. It's, oof. Such parents, what kind of parenting would that be? I mean, <laughs> let's see, 92. Preparing idea like this, and a lot of the times in this structure, when you play f3, g4, and he has the pawn on h5, that is the biggest target, okay? So he takes, you always take uh, with a queen in this structure, boom. Because we're preparing a uh, long castle. Okay, I mean, with these pawns, maybe not long castle, but in general, that's why you take with a queen. And we're pretty happy to see a move like f6. But still, once again, you could take. But that's kind of releasing tension. I'm just going to play simple. Boom. Knight g3. Okay, he takes. I'm like happy that he opens up a uh, rook's path for us. Yeah, I mean, take and then... Pretty much checkmate, taking checkmate, it even rims. So, okay, g6, happy to take you with the queen, give a check, and then uh, we get a very nice little uh, pattern with this so called, uh, is it a ladder mate? I think it kind of can agree it's a ladder mate. And notice that opponent genuinely gets mated with these pieces never moving. And we, we also didn't have to take. Okay, I'll show you a secret thing though. Because a lot of you may be confused, okay, is it like such a big deal not to take on b6? Or like if I would have taken immediately, will that change things? Okay, let me show you something. Okay, check making has nowhere to go. Let's just imagine in this position, you decide, uh, okay, you play e3. Let's say here, instead of bishop d3, you decide to take, okay? You take because whatever, you're bored. And then you do bishop d3, he takes, you take with the queen. Because you know, that's what Alex Banza told you to do. And all of a sudden, because this thing was opened, there is this thing to be careful of, okay? Why? Because if you take, the rook remains undefended. So it's just some extra things that you need to keep an eye on if you would have taken earlier. So that's why I delayed it and it actually turned out we never really even had to play the move. So, uh, yeah, key ideas to take away. Remember that uh, when bishop goes on to b4, play a3 immediately, question that bishop, and uh, you see bishop on f5, you play f3, try to hand it down with the pawns. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting it on a white game, facing an opponent that's uh, rated 645. Gonna be sticking with the Jobavalon, and we get a principled opening so far. We have a normal starting position on the board and uh, <laughs> opponent wanted to chat. He he sent me an emoji. Does he know us? Maybe. I don't know. He plays bishop to f5. However, we'll stick to the gameplay. So when the bishop lands on f5 and you are playing the job of London, as a rule of thumb, you see the bishop there, you go f3. That's just triggering it, okay? I don't really know how to explain it. It's like a magnet type of effect. Bishop lands on f5. It's attracting the pawn to f3. Okay, this is how I want you to think about it. And he plays the move knight to c6. Okay, we're just continuing with uh, yeah our pawn push. That's the idea of f3. A lot of these games, you're just going to be able to win by genuinely using your pawns. Okay, imagine we can almost trap a bishop. He plays h5. When h5 happens, uh, you have to do g5, and uh, we're getting rid of that knight. The knight moves away, and 
Okay, here we have simple move because this is a common mistake for uh, this rating range, which by the way, you can uh, go ahead and pause the video, try to find the winning continuation for white. And the point is, when the knight goes back, it's blocking the queen. So pawn is no longer defending, uh, defended by the queen. So we can just take it. However, you're probably curious. Okay, you're just able to win these games because 600 players make blunders and uh, otherwise you cannot win it. Maybe. I guess we'll find out. I'm going to play e3. Maybe you're right. But I'm going to play e3 and try to play like a normal structure. You know. Expecting he goes e6, we play bishop d3 and we get, uh, we get a position. Okay, typical position for the Jabava London. Okay, he plays e5. He's like really asking me to take that pawn. Okay, if he wants to grab to like really do it this way, I'm going to grab. Okay, at this point, I don't have much of a choice but to grab. It's going to take, I go queen d5 and okay, we play that position. I wonder how bad can this be? Okay, he takes, we take with a knight, target c7. Let's see, is he gonna uh, long castle? Oh, he plays bishop to b4. Now, I feel like a lot of people will be tempted to take thinking, uh, I'm gonna be taking and then I'm gonna be taking free knight. Yeah, but then there is a fork. How is the fork? Did you evaluate the fork? I don't know, fork looks uh, pretty unclear. So for this reason, I think we'll just stick with simple move, c3, targeting the bishop and just gaining tempo. Bishop goes back, so meaning bishop defends uh, c7 pawn. Here, I think we have a very interesting uh, potential combo. I mean, not like a combo, but a very nice idea to use. So there is b4. Very concrete, okay? You play b4 only if you see the following move. And the thing with knights is that they are very nice when uh, they can defend each other like that. But the problem is, if a pawn comes in the way, it's kind of breaking, uh, you know, the party. It's like, you know, two guys that are best friends and one of them gets a girlfriend. Like b5 happens and then the guys never talk again. So they, 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 don't, they, they stop hanging out. We all been there. Like, being the dumb friend, not the girlfriend part. So, he takes, boom, targeting. Alright, what do we do next? We can take, but that will kind of improve uh, his pawn structure, so... Okay, I'm not sure if you're, like, paying attention to this, but we genuinely just want a piece, and now we're just getting uh, into the mode of trading all the pieces. And then getting into the end game. Now... Bishop being on g6, I'd be pretty tempted to play e4 and restrict it. You can also like long castle and gain a tempo. I'm gonna start with that. Okay, long castle, attacking the knight. By the way, I know some of you may be wondering, oh, how can you long castle? Like the bishop is cutting away this square. Yes, so this doesn't matter because the rook is not going through any checks. It's just the king that is the rule. So if king was going through b1, that was illegal. But it's not, so... King is not going through check, then it means you can long castle. He plays knight c5. Now, you go ahead, pause the video, try to find the winning continuation, just increasing the advantage even more. I'll give you a hint. Whenever you have a chess position, you want to get into the habit of looking for uh, hanging pieces or undefended pieces rather. Knight on c5, completely undefended. So we take advantage of it. Boom, double attack. Once you start sporting this sort of uh, undefended pieces, your frequency of finding the winning move will increase by at least 50%. Trust me, it is genuinely the best just advice that uh, I can give you. All right? No course, no whatever, anything will help you more than this. Looking for undefended pieces when you're below 1,000. So just going to take, he checks me. Don't want to play bishop d4 because then I self-pin. Just going to stay here. And next move, ready to play e4 to shut down this bishop. Okay, not if he's attacking my stuff. Uh, I'm just going to defend, I guess. He has c5 annoying move, but then we have intermediate e4. So that's not a problem. Um, taking was also fine, like free pawn, but... When we have so much extra material, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, if you just take another like additional pawn... 
it's much rather uh, you'd much rather stay active and live a healthy life. Japan is disconnected. Do you think he just uh, rage quit? He may. I mean, losing against uh, such a weak player like myself, that is genuinely the <laughs> most normal reaction one can have. But yeah, he turns out he simply left the game. And uh, yeah, main takeaways from these games. Play f3 when you see bishop on f5. When h5 gets played, stopping you from winning the bishop. You push. And if they play knight e7, that is a free pawn. Okay, you can take. It's free to take. I did not, hoping to get a normal game and show you how to play these positions. But when he's like forcing my hand with e5, I gotta take. And then, uh, yeah, important sequence b4. Just literally winning a piece thanks to b5. So. With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. And open up with d4. Facing a 700 rated opponent. I'm gonna be sticking with the aggressive Jabavala. And the opponent plays e6, so pretty prematurely blocking the bishop. We're gonna get our little setup, and uh, on knight f6, we play knight b5. On bishop d6, we play e3. Okay, very important, guys. You really wanna remember this concept. If you're like, uh, you know, playing, if you like watch the channel in the past or you just play normal London system and you're making the transition, your instinct is playing bishop g3, okay? We don't do that here. We just play the move e3. Always on bishop d6. It's either e3 or if the knight is already developed, then you play knight e5. But here it's not, so we play e3. Okay, now a lot of you are just having uh, kind of nightmares with getting double pawns thinking they are weak. I would say it's really kind of the same situation as, uh, let's say, when you have to fly somewhere. You think, okay, I need to get on the plane. That's very dangerous. What if I die? Dude, that is literally the safest transport on Earth. You're safer on the plane that, than you are at your house. It's like, that's not a thing. Same with these pawns, okay? It is very safe structure and very easy to play. Because even if they take, you can always defend with g3, pretty much. You can parachute out of the plane, if you will. Now, if f5 gets played, this is just leading to a bit of a weird pawn structure. Goes into some kind of a dutch, which, yeah, I mean, I guess Netherlands can be a nice country, but the dutch defense is not my favorite opening for black. <laughs> I like to face the dutch. It plays even like a stonewall dutch, which means, okay, what is the main drawback uh, of the stonewall dutch? Where on e5 is not defended by other pawns, meaning it's a very nice outpost, okay? If you want to think about it this way, it's pretty much you can think of the center of the board as uh, the most expensive area of the city, okay? It's very costly to rent or own a property there. Now, I pretty much get a rent-free knight on e5 for the rest of the game. It's... Just, he, he has no way to kick me out with any pawns, so... Uh, I'm gonna get the knight there, and... Okay, also important to understand that bishop is kind of restricted. Okay, this is a bit tricky, as our bishop is also a bit restricted as well by his pawns, but... These are basically... Okay, we're just scratching the surface of the stone wall. Gonna get bishop to d3. And expecting him to castle short. And the nice thing about this structure, okay, when you're thinking about uh, the way to break through, is that, well, you gotta use a hook. Because it may be pretty challenging to break the stone wall. It's, it's a pretty solid opening. It takes uh, patience to crash it. But the idea is, you need to understand this is the hook. Okay, he plays queen 7 okay, this guy's playing pretty well so far. Okay, seems... Uh, Seems normal player. He's very playing very well for this rating range. I was expecting knight e7 mainly, but queen c7 is uh, is best, keeping the bishop defended. And on castle, I would have played g4. Now, because I'm not sure he castled short, I may want to delay that. But I think it's nice to like get the attack uh, rolling, anyways. And the point is, when they take with a pawn, you don't take, but you gambit the pawn. That is pretty important idea that you want to get used to. While facing the stone wall. Okay, there's another way to do h3, g4, but that's like slower and kind of predictable. So I like g4. Is he gonna take with a knight? Then I think we just have a uh, knight takes. 
at least. I mean, maybe I've got other moves as well. Um, I'm expecting pawn take generally. I think the best move should be knight capture. Okay, he just plays knight e4. Uh, well, we can take, I think, and then open up queen's path. That was kind of the point. And the difference is, well, in the past, checking was not a thing. But now I'm thinking, can we do that and then check g6 and then go knight takes? Like his main argument can be that there is maybe queen f7. But then, yeah, I don't know. We can also like start by taking this. I got really mixed feelings about this. But I think, uh, yeah, I, f I feel like we got to open first. We got to do this and perhaps we take on e4 before we check. I think that's the play. It's just something that's kind of fishy about that setup because he genuinely made uh, a lot of moves without like prioritizing castling, which is, yeah, rather odd for, uh, for this, I would say. And I think he's about to get punished for it. Okay. I'm going to show you after the game how you are supposed to play against the most common uh, castle. And okay, if he does that, well, we have simple uh, play here. Just collect the free pawn. Nothing really all that uh, fancy here. Taking very reasonable. Oh, he just took the pawn, which is a mistake. You should prioritize taking pieces over pawns. I get to keep my knight. Targeting this, so... Okay, it turns out to be just an effortless win with a lot of hanging pieces along the way, but... Uh, I mean, the opening... He had a very good opening. Then I don't know what happened. It's like... Uh, <laughs> in the opening, he was Magnus Carlsen, and then uh, in the... <laughs> In the middle game, he trans transformed into Frank or something. <laughs> Just gonna take these. Uh, am I actually making a mistake myself? I don't think I am, because I we wanted to go for a counter attack. And on bishop takes, I think we have simple move takes. There is also like queen g4, kind of forcing him to take, but yeah, so there is simple move and then. Maybe even f4. f4 could be a move. Unnecessary to play f4 there. Like, really unnecessary. Do we have knight h6 check? That could be, like, crazy. Rook g1, king there. Man, I wish we could make knight h6 work. Too bad that uh, it doesn't really work, I think. So instead, I'm going to play it uh, pretty simple, takes, then bring the knight back, and that's what uh, any decent human would do. Okay, knight d4 or knight g3, I prefer knight g3, knight d4 he had c5 idea, use this, preparing to play like queen h5, uh, which is either trading queens or uh, forcing checkmate on queen b2, just simple rook b1 or i could even castle just to get my king to safety so no more checks bishop h3 uh yeah simple move forcing queens off attacking everything end game is very much an effortless win so you can definitely go for uh, stuff like this i think you gotta watch out for a move though there is one move that you need uh, to avoid blundering i think he's gonna take and he's gonna bring the other rook to the open file and I feel like a lot of people could uh, go wrong in that position by playing knight f4. I'm gonna show uh, I'm gonna show you what I mean in a second. Because then black has uh, a great move to just uh, come back. Okay, taking here. If he attacks, I go back or there. Expecting this, however, where knight f4 is a mistake as there is rook captures since we are pinned. So this is really something that uh, you want to keep an eye on. Okay, opponent has a choice between either rook 8 or rook f7. These are the most logical moves, I would say. Rook f7 preparing to double rooks or just rook e8. I would play rook e8 myself if I if I was black here. But uh, okay, in bishop g2, I have only move. Attack this. 
expecting him to target a knight and then uh well we can go ahead and grab because these are a bunch of juicy free pawns boom can check can take i'm just gonna play like knight f4 oh i actually had even better move king d2 was better damn it could have sacked the knight king d2 was better preparing mate Cannot castle because uh, the bishop covers d1. So I'm just going to do king d2. And next up, uh, when the rook joins, by the way, important move, we're also avoiding that. And uh, oh, don't play rook g1. That allows king takes. So I gotta like trade first. And then I'm going to like uh, pick up another pawn. Gonna sidestep the check. I mean, king anywhere is fine. And I'm going to bring the rook. Do we have a force checkmate? I don't quite see it. I'm just gonna play uh, Rook G7. Oh no, it's gonna be a pre move battle. <laughs> All right, close game. Very close. I mean, completely winning from the beginning, but uh, it got closer than it should have. So, okay, on G4, I told you best move is Knight takes. And I wasn't like super sure how to evaluate this position. I guess, okay. We got bad pawns, but at least there is activity for it. Like castle. Um, maybe like sidestep with queen h4. Bishop is bad. But I think what most people would do against you, they castle. And then you have g4, strong move. And then like pawn takes you to h3. And this is like genuinely crashing the... The Dutch and the Stonewall in general. So this is really the key idea to um, take away from this. And yeah, in case you were wondering what my calculation was here after GF5, I was thinking he takes. And then point was to take and then throw in the check. So that on G6 there is knight takes. And the whole idea is there is no more queen f7 pinning because then the bishop remains undefended. Which uh, was not a thing. If you do like g6 right away, if queen f7 and you think, oh, there is this move, he has knight takes. And still there is this issue. Okay, apparently I have knight f4 back, which I forgot about during the game. But uh, this was pretty much the only resource that you had to watch out. Because if not queen f7, then he resigns. But queen f7 can sometimes be a very cold shower. So you really need to keep an eye on this uh, whenever you think about uh, such tactics. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting another white game. One away from reaching uh, our goal for the video, 700. We're one point away. And uh, opponent plays d5, so very standard stuff so far. Gonna begin uh, with the knight, and then we are ready to develop the bishop, of course, getting the most standard position for the variation. And okay, once again, even uh, us, you get to climb a little bit, we see this very common mistake. Now, if you've been paying attention to the beginning of the video, you should be able uh, that uh, at this point uh, to find the move that is sort of refuting black setup. So, point is, they are no longer able to defend against this uh, very annoying uh, fork. Just, uh, you know, the knight and bishops are uh, cooperating uh, perfectly here. Teaming up against the c7 square. And, uh, okay, we'll open and try e5. Like, in the first game, we just saw e6 simply allowing the fork. It would be very interesting if he plays e5. Hopefully, we can get to show some of the, uh, yeah, before mentioned ideas. Um, and... I can show you what's best to recapture with. I normally recommend you take with a pawn. However, taking with a bishop is also playable. But it seems like opponent is already going into the tank. And okay, he plays e5 finally. Gonna stick with my recommendation. Taking with a pawn. And are we gonna see knight e4 or knight h5? And once again, I already explained uh, what is the important move for white uh, in this position. So please feel free to uh, pause the video and uh, try to find it on your own. Because white has a very nice little idea to get a winning position. And if you're thinking e6, that is not the most accurate way of playing. Key idea, queen takes on d5. Why? 
because, uh, well, temporarily sacrificing the queen, but then uh, we get this uh, lot of intermediate fork getting to recapture and uh, yeah. Then you just enjoy life with three extra points. Okay, it's actually not that simple. I know a lot of people that uh, get into this uh, winning scenario and they still have a hard time converting. By the way, I expect either bishop e6 or bishop c5 in this position. Let's see what my opponent is going to play. And okay, he starts bishop c5. Whenever he makes a move, you need to ask yourself, okay, what is the threat? What is the idea? We see that he is uh, putting pressure on f2. Therefore, we play the move e3. Now, expecting uh, bishop to e6. And as long as you know how to react in the following moves, you should be good to go. And I would say the main takeaway that you want to remember is whenever something like bishop e6 targeting the knight happens, you don't castle long because that allows knight f2. So instead, you just meet bishop e6 with a move like rook d1 and then you play f3 getting rid of the knight. So on rook e8, I think we're going to do something pretty similar. I mean, I can start rook d1 right away because, uh, you know, opponent has to deal with a pretty nasty discovery. Like I could move the knight maybe here, maybe there. Both rooks are uh, in danger. And expecting a move like bishop d7. That was literally the only thing to uh, avoid the nasty discovery. And I'm going to do knight f6 check. Okay, looks like completely hanging knight, but we go for discovery, and then we have a choice between taking on e4 or on e8. Now, it is actually a very important question for you. Which one should we take? Technically, rook is worth 5 points, and the knight is only worth 3 points. But uh, the trick here is that if you take the rook, you will also get to win your knight. So you're only ahead 2 points in material. But, if you take on e4, you're ahead 3 points. So... A full piece, it's uh, much better than just an exchange. Uh, you know, when you win uh, rook for knight, it's usually called uh, you win an exchange in uh, in chess, in case that's confusing. So, yeah, just up a full piece right now uh, using the trap, move 12. Opponent doesn't really have any kind of play, to be honest. Uh, normally, yeah, sometimes they may get a few threats and if you, like, deal with them, should be okay here, he got none of that, apparently, and, uh, well, it is still important that uh, you stay very focused, okay? Most uh, common mistake that you can make in such uh, situations, you think, oh, I'm already, like, up a piece, I'm, like, completely winning. You start uh, playing careless, you think uh, the, win is, the game is gonna win itself anyways. Yeah, you do that, and... <laughs> Congratulations, you just uh, doubled your chances to mess up the game. No, just still stay, you know. Okay, ultra focus would be nice, but just I would say normal focus is important. So, uh, yeah, like really the hardest games to win are the one where you have a winning position. So if you just focus on that alone, on, you know, how to win uh, your winning positions, like... In poker, there is a concept on, uh, you know, how to get the most uh, value out of your good hands. Okay, I, I don't want to go into like in depth with that, whether it's like good or not, but just to kind of make an analogy. Uh, so if in poker you focus on uh, getting the most value out of your uh, good hands, then here it's kind of similar like uh, trying to maximize your win rate from uh, better positions or winning positions even. So... Okay, we see opponent simply resigned. I mean, I don't really expect a lot of them to resign, but the position was like a plus five. So I was expecting him to do something like bishop to b6 and probably because this may be a thing, we have nice useful move a3, also stopping any knight jumps. And then we finish development, get castle, put a knight on to d6 and the game should win itself slowly, so... Made it to 700, not a biggie. Just remember, play the Jubava London, punish them with knight b5 uh, if you can, uh, with bishop f5 with uh, f3, and all the other uh, mentioned ideas into this video. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the 
following video. In case you wanted to pick up my normal London course, it is currently on a sale for two more days and I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up for what my plans uh, in the future are because I'm actually really serious about this uh, Jabava London opening. You know, it's not like just, you know, a meme opening where you're just hoping to get the knight to b5 and get the four because that's like in a nutshell, how a lot of people tend to see it. But this is actually way more serious and way more interesting than uh, than it seems. And uh, for that, I hired Badur Jobava, the actual inventor of the opening, in order to make a course together with him. I mean, I'm going to be mainly explaining it, but we also have him showing some of his best games and also playing uh, against low-rated players. So Jobava London will be a big... Uh, independent project for myself and uh, as well as the uh, Karo Khan course for Black uh, where we're gonna be focusing on the middle games uh, chapters. I know like a lot of you have been uh, wondering uh, what is up with that, why don't we have it uh, like you know in the normal London course. So the thing is if I had to sort of include all of that it would have probably taken me another additional six months to release the course. So yeah, just figured out it's better idea to have it separate and this should also be supposed to be released towards the end of the year. So thanks a lot for making it this far into the video and I'll see you around on the channel. Take care.